Right, I think we're legally allowed to proceed, but let's see if we can get um, Carlos or Senator Skinner or, Senator, or Assemblymember Kamlogger to join in before we start. There we go. Okay, um, so now we're going to what, we're, what we've been calling uh, colloquially old business. Um, which is the time for the, the staff and in particular Tom, who I hope you all know and I've encouraged for you all to get to know uh, better, um, to report back to us on the priorities that we've identified um, from our previous meetings, plural. So eventually, uh, you know, this time he's just getting back to us on the, on the, uh, hearing that we had on collaborative courts, but eventually he'll be giving us updates on various different topics and research issues. The point here is just to further refine our thinking and keep us on track. Um, we are not here to uh, affirm, affirmatively um, recommend or thumbs up or thumbs down on any particular proposal, but just um, hear where Tom is going and give um, some direction one way or another or raise questions about um, where things are headed. So with that said, Tom, uh, why don't you take it away? Great, so I've got um, some slides that will I think help guide our discussion here. Uh, what I'm gonna do is just go through the five or six things that uh, we spoke about, give sort of a brief summary of what they are, hit some of the high points, and then we can have a few things to talk about if we think it's appropriate, obviously, interrupt me at any time, or uh, Mike, if you want me to move on, <laughs> as you like to do sometimes, please let me know. Um, so the first thing we have is a misdemeanor diversion. So what this is, is a, it would allow a judge to set conditions for somebody, and if the person meets those conditions in a misdemeanor case, the case is dismissed. Um, and I think what's notable about the way we would approach this is the prosecutor wouldn't need to consent to it. So prosecutors can set up these programs as we we'll sort of talk about uh, in the next topic um, at their discretion. And it's, um, I think, rare for a judge in California to be able to have that kind of control. And of course, this was based on um, discussion that we had with Judge Lowenthal at the last meeting who described a pilot project in Los Angeles. Um, and as I said, judges can't do this under current law. I wanna talk a little bit um, about the scope here. So uh, the most recent data shows there are a, a quarter of a million misdemeanor uh, filings that breaks down between traffic and non-traffic. So we're talking about a lot of things here as I'm sure all, all of you all know, but you know, I sort of know that number whenever I see it, I'm like, it takes me back. Um, you know, sort of related to our discussion on short, short sentences, I think we've become so inured to the size of the system that, you know, we people maybe not spend too much time thinking about misdemeanor cases, but they're extremely important. It can be, you know, your first step to really being enmeshed in the system. And as we'll talk about, uh, they can have pretty bad um, immigration consequences as well in some cases. So uh, one way to think about this is to see what happened when Los Angeles had this. This is just one view into this. So I put together a chart here. I felt left out from all the charts we were seeing. I wanted to see if I could participate in that. Uh, and this is the trial rate for misdemeanors in Los Angeles County. Uh, always low. I mean, if you look at the numbers on the left side, we're talking things hovering around 1% or less. And if you look at the number of filings there are, I mean, it's a very low trial rate, as I'm sure Judge Espinosa and uh, Justice Moreno could tell us about. Uh, so this last bar here, this is right when the misdemeanor pilot, the diversion pilot started in Los Angeles. And this is what happened the next two years. I mean, the tr trial rate just plummeted. Whether that's directly attributable, obviously we need to do a lot more data. It may not be possible to figure that out, but that was Judge Lowenthal's um, takeaway was that the program had that significant of an effect. So even I think just from a court congestion, judicial resources, cost of having people come to court for trials, um, seems like it had a big impact. Uh, and I do wanna talk about the immigration issues here. And uh, you know, the immigration system, talk about counterintuitive findings from we had yesterday. I mean, there are misdemeanors that can result in you being deported and there are extremely serious felonies that can't. So it's a real minefield and requires a lot of specialization. But there are misdemeanors that can result in that. And I think the important thing to know is that if you admit guilt at any time in a judicial proceeding, even if your case is dismissed and thrown out as it would be in a diversion program, 
that admission of guilt still counts for immigration purposes. Uh, so I think that alone suggests that a program like this should not require an admission of guilt and um, should proceed before that happens. Uh, you know, there are other reasons to do that as well, but I think that's sort of the most important one, particularly in California with, uh, you know, the demographics of our, of our population here. Tom, I, I, I don't think the answer, we have the answer, but do we have any sense of the number of um, folks who are impacted by immigration, whose immigration cases or status is, is impacted by misdemeanor? I'm sure we can get that. Um, you know, the, I, I don't have it at my fingertips. You know, the one thing I can speak to about that is uh, Rose Kahn, an attorney at the Immigrant Legal Resource Center wrote a letter to the committee about this issue and she mentioned for a drug diversion program that formerly required admission of guilt, thousands of people may have been deported as a result of that in California. So it's significant. I mean, I think even one person is too much, honestly, and I think a lot of prosecutors would agree when I've been speaking to folks about this here, I think there's a lack of awareness that your case can be dismissed, but it still counts. It's just uh, a very harsh consequence that I think even everyone trying to avoid it would not necessarily be aware of unless you have that specialized immigration knowledge, uh, which is even more complex than credits, unfortunately, and changing and subject to so many of the political issues that are you know, in the news a lot. Uh, wanted to briefly mention other states that give judges similar power um, to show that something like this would not be you know, going too far out on a limb. I mean, we see the list here. Uh, these programs are a little different. These all require some admission of guilt and then the judge essentially places someone on probation. They can dismiss the case. Uh, but some of these programs cover felony cases too. So I think that's notable. There are two states that uh, are more like the program that I'm suggesting here and that's Connecticut and Nevada. Uh, neither of these require guilty plea. Connecticut covers some felony offenses. In Nevada, it's a new statute. It was uh, passed in 2017, so I think it's their sort of first step into this world, but uh, those might be models for us to look at and try to get some more information about. So a few things to discuss. Uh, the first is we talked about the sort of pending public safety trailer bill in the context of the uh, elderly release, there is a misdemeanor diversion program very similar to what I'm talking about here in that bill. Um, so if that passes, our work will be done in many ways. Though I think we can still have a discussion about whether it should be expanded to cover some low level felonies or if there should be any tweaks to it. And there's some things to keep in mind when thinking about this, you know, should any type of misdemeanor offense not be included as part of it? Should we expand it to think about low level felonies? Should that admission of guilt be required or not required? I mean, you can obviously tell where my thinking is on a lot of these things. Uh, and then what does someone's conviction history have to do with it? Do with it? Um, you know, if you had a misdemeanor conviction five years ago, are you no longer eligible if you went through diversion before? Those sorts of things. Um, so those are some of the contours you tend to see in these programs, some of the decisions uh, that would go into a recommendation for something like this. So that's my spiel on misdemeanor diversion. Anybody has any questions, thoughts, happy to uh, discuss. All right, well, it sounds like- uh, um, What is the status of the bill? I'm sorry, I was muted there for a second. No problem. Uh, it passed the Senate and I think it is uh, still in process in the assembly. That's um, the best I can say at this point. All right, and it, it addresses exclusion of certain misdemeanors and- uh, It does uh, not- it, Oh, admission of guilt, no? It, uh, it does not explicitly require an admission of guilt. Um, it doesn't address that issue particularly one way or the other, but I think because it doesn't require it, one would not be required. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't exclude any misdemeanors or anything. It's a very broad program for my um, reading of it. So it's- uh, which I think makes sense. I mean, a misdemeanor by definition is a non-serious offense in many ways. And right. you know, it's at the judge's discretion. So uh, many judges I think are able to filter out the cases where it would be appropriate when they would right. not be appropriate. Right. Well, I, I would just say from a pol purely political perspective, mm -hmm. if you don't exclude the cases of domestic violence yeah. and drunk driving or driving under the influence, it's gonna, it's gonna hit a wall. I think yeah. with, with various groups and just, and just an observation. And right. does this apply to misdemeanors generally, like in the vehicle code as well? 
as yeah. opposed to the penal code? <laughs> I would assume so. That's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's my working assumption. Yeah. And, you know, in those type of exclusions, Judge Espinosa, that's exactly what the pilot program had and, and what you see yeah. in some of these other states as well. Yeah. Um, getting back to, you know, the politics of it, I think that we should, you know, unfortunately, our lawmakers are not here to, to weigh in. My first fallback, let's say we have an idea policy that we think all misdemeanors should be it's a matter of pure policy. Not saying we do agree that, but let's just say we fall there. My position, first fallback would be, maybe can we have presumptions instead of absolute black and white exclusions? Meaning domestic violence are presumptively excluded unless somebody proves X, Y, or Z. Um, and likewise, can we expand the program because certain low level felonies might be perfectly appropriate, but maybe we have a presumption against unless we can, you know, A, B, and C say that we should be included. So I think in general, I mean, there are always concerns when you add discretion into the system, but um, I, my initial instinct between on eligibility issues should be before we draw black and white lines to have uh, grayer lines of presumption um, to allow more flexibility. Just my instinct, but. I that makes sense. I, I fully support that instinct. That makes sense. Okay. Agreed. Um, so Tom, so looks looks like that you have you know we're going to track the AB eighty eight um, and start looking at other s states for some more details and answer Justice Moreno's questions about does this touch the vehicle code? Does it touch health and safety code? Is it all misdemeanors? Um, and um, you know maybe start thinking about if we would need to build in presumptions. How might that? Uh, Work. I'm also very curious about the scope of the immigration um, problem. Um, I, could, I could do, what do you mean? I may be able to speak about that for a second. Meaning like, okay, um, if the admission of guilt problem issue is purely an immigration question or is primarily an immigration question, how big, how big is the scope? You know, maybe this is just this sort of gets into the politics of it, and maybe I, I shouldn't. I'm not warning my own advice, but I'm guessing that we're going to get pushback on the admission of guilt question. And if we're going to be say that it's very important, but we should know how many people it impacts. And I know it's beyond immigration, but let's say immigration is the most important factor. If it's if it's a huge number of people who get misdemeanors impacts their immigration status, then that's important. If it's a small number, I mean, it's like the law, the, the, the 40 year jail sentences, you know, right. we should know. I, you know, there's that number, but there's also the people who seek, who, who don't enter diversion because they're afraid of, of the consequence and they may try to get some other resolution to a different charge which might, which might result in jail time. Sometimes you see those resolutions where people will go in to avoid that more serious thing. But I, I, I agree that scope issue is a good one. And one way around it that I uh, have heard about that other states do is the defendant writes a stipulation of guilt. It essentially goes in an envelope in the judge's desk for a metaphor. And then if they need it later, boom, you know, it can sort of play that role of, okay, you, you're not going to be able to, you know, um, Take advantage of the situation, but I believe because it's not technically on the record in open court, it may not count for immigration purposes. Um, so that might be another way to do it. I don't like adding that level of complexity, um, um, but that might be another way to address it is to sort of, you know, uh, get all the benefits of admission of guilt without some of the consequences, if that makes sense. I had another question, and maybe this goes even to Peter. Um, so I, I was struck. I didn't quite realize that so few, and you know, in retrospect, of course, it makes sense that so few misdemeanor cases go to trial, right? So if our main benefit of this bill is to reduce the trial load, 
but we're already at 1% or 2%. Is it still a huge number and that's important or what, what's your t take on that? Well, I've lost track, um, but I know that the rate at which misdemeanors are filed in Los Angeles County has been dropping by about 50,000 a year over the last few years. When I was keeping track of that 10 years ago, we had about a half a million a year in LA County. I think it's down significantly from that number. So it's not a big part of the court's backlog. I think the more important, the more important um, aspect of this bill is the fact that any conviction, even outside of the collateral immigration consequences, creates barriers for successful reentry for people, right? When they're filling out job applications or they're trying to rent houses or, um, so I think it's the avoidance of a criminal conviction that is the sort of motivating factor here. I don't think, um, I, I don't really, I haven't, I can't answer the what would the impact be on the court's operation question. I'm just yeah. too far removed from that. Do we yeah, I'm, also, I'm, I'm yeah. also very far removed from it, but I can recall a time when I was a, on the municipal court in Compton where the only trials I did were DUIs. Right. Uh, you could settle just about any other case, but the DUIs because of the collateral consequences on someone's privilege to drive were the driving force and that's what was at stake. Yeah. But the, the regular penal code type cases, you can generally offer something that would resolve the case. I think I did like 20 DUI trials in a row. That was the only thing that kept us in trial. And that's why I mentioned the vehicle code thing, because that's, that's highly sensitive. Uh, and I doubt that uh, any kind of discretion would be given to a judge to divert those kinds of cases. I really do. I just I, I actually happen to have the another chart. I got a little chart happy on the uh, misdemeanor filings in, in LA County. So I, I think I hope you guys can see it. But uh, yeah, you can sort of see that trend line. And, and these this is the it matches up that other chart. So those last two bars are. Um, so, yeah. so what is what is it's a little hard for for me to to oh, see. So let me see if I can. Is that any okay. better? If I zoom in. Yeah, there you go. That's perfect. So it's around it's around two hundred thousand right now. A little little a little under. And this is you know two ish years old too. So yeah, maybe, yeah. So that that's a remarkable, yeah. that's a remarkable <laughs> number, particularly when you when you consider the drop, right? Yeah. Um, but also when so many um, crimes that were formerly felonies mm. during this time became misdemeanors, yeah. right? And the numbers are still dropping. So what's going on? Don't know. You know, the, the law enforcement people will tell you that they just don't bother, right? When they no. find somebody with a crack pipe or a small amount of drugs, they just throw the drugs away and send them on their way. That's, that's the anecdotal sort of, they don't bother anymore because they're, it's not a felony. I don't, know what the, I don't know what the real evidence is or what the real data would be, but I, I think that's, that's pretty interesting in, when there were all these new misdemeanors added to the penal code after Prop 47 that the numbers continued to come down. Yeah, they're almost half. All right. Uh, can we very go back for one sec to, yeah. Tom, can you go back to your discussion items? Sure. Let me, uh... there we go. So I just want to talk about each one just briefly. Uh, if we're going to set politics aside, then I wouldn't even go the presumption route. Uh, like if we're talking about should there be any type of misdemeanors excluded, uh, my answer would be no. Uh, and, and it wouldn't matter to me that there are particular groups who care very much about domestic violence. I do too, but the domestic violence situation is far more complicated than I think people often address and to create a presumption is to really say misdemeanors are excluded because once you create the presumption it becomes very difficult to overcome the presumption uh, so um, i would be against presumptions um, really uh, the only reason i would be argue for them is because i'm now considering the politics of the moment uh, same thing with low-level felonies right we all know that many of the low-level felonies should actually be misdemeanors and so i wouldn't exclude or create any presumption just because the penal code classifies something as a felony because many of those felonies should not actually be felonies. And, and the reason I'm saying some of this is because 
if we are viewing everything we're doing from a racial justice lens, which I think we must, because the, you can't talk about the criminal justice system without thinking about race. The two are too intertwined. So it, it just seems to me that it is part of the work we do. Um, admission of guilt, absolutely not. Uh, for, uh, again, for so many reasons. We know that there are significant racial disparities in who is arrested for misdemeanors. We know that if you have a, people plead guilty to misdemeanors all the time when they are in fact innocent, right? Like we, we, we know that too. Uh, to plead, to have an admission of guilt, a lot of times there's so much pressure to plead guilty. Many of our clients for public defenders know that because people just wanna get out so that they can return back to their jobs instead of sitting in pretrial custody waiting for some trial because they can't actually get out on bail, however you think of bail. The other problem with admissions of guilt, they have nothing to do with immigration, is the fact that so many policing practices that violate the Fourth Amendment occur in misdemeanor world. And if we admit guilt, part of the reason there's so much pressure is because we just don't want to litigate, not we. Prosecutors just don't want to litigate the problematic policing practices that continue to occur. And so if there's an admission of guilt because all the pressure, including from criminal defendants who are accused of conduct is to plead guilty, means there is no way to uncover and fight the policing practices that are so deeply problematic, right? So there shouldn't be an admission of guilt, we, or, uh, and there should be better um, bail and pretrial release options. That is the way to address being able to have trials, because I think there actually should be more misdemeanor trials than there are. Um, it's just that we view misdemeanors as being low-level crimes, where in fact, sometimes the misdemeanor system is far more impactful than the felony system is. So if I weren't considering politics, it would be, are there any misdemeanors excluded? No. Low level felonies included? Yes. Admission of guilt? No. Conviction history or prior uh, diversion resolutions, should we consider them? Sure, except for the fact that once again, if we are gonna you think about criminal justice with a racial justice lens, we know that there will be disparities in conviction history, especially with misdemeanors, given the proactive policing practices that focus on particular communities and particular people. So I, my answer to all of these things are no exclusions for any of these things and leaving, and this is in the utopian world that I hope to exist, not the political world in which we do exist. So I just wanted to say that about this entire um, list of questions that are up for discussion. I have a question. I'm um, embarrassed to have to ask it. I should know the answer to this. Are the low-level felonies we're talking about all wobbler offenses? You know, I don't think uh, I've begun to address it with that level of specificity. That's an obvious place to start, I think. Um, you know, we could also think about realigned offenses. You know, there, there are some lines that are already drawn in the penal code like that, or yeah. it could be a, a different, you know, list in, entirely. Um, so haven't gotten that far, but that's the obvious next step. Okay. And uh, thank you, Dane Richardson. I, uh, I, I totally appreciate that. I spoke to uh, Alexandra Napatoff, who I, I know you blurbed her book about misdemeanor. So um, obviously it's something that uh, uh, it's, super important to think about. And um, I think uh, that's why I tried to frame it as, you know, misdemeanors are too often forgotten in some of these discussions. And I think, um, you know, the committee uh, has a big role. It's, it's worth our time and attention for those things as well as we continue. All right, any more thoughts on the misdemeanor diversion program? The notes I have, Tom, are um, not in any particular order. We could figure out why misdemeanor arrests are down so dramatically. That might be a lead for us for other things, interestingly, you know, this unintended consequence of research. Um, you know, does it, and is it statewide or just San, or just Los Angeles? <clears throat> um, or if we consider adding low level felonies, which ones? Um, I was curious about, are there benefits of diversion? Supposedly the benefit is fewer court trials, 
but are there benefits of the diversion program? Meaning are they getting into programs that seem to be working? Um, and then uh, data, you know, we just should just tack that onto everything, more data, especially around racial disparities. I'm curious about also mental health. Um, so those are my notes. Yeah, I just, I just have one other observation. You know, I mean, it seems like the uh, drop in felony filings is consistent with everything you hear about the, the drop in um, criminal activity generally in California. Crime is down, continues to go down decade after decade. So that's pretty dramatic, though, Peter. I mean, like, yeah, half, yeah, know. no, it is. It's a, it's a big number. It's, it's huge. And and so the, that, that wasn't arrest. That was misdemeanor filing. So that's arrests that become cases. So it'd be interesting yeah. to see what that acceptance or declination rate is, is too. Yeah. Um, totally agree. Mike, on the, you know, is diversion working, racial disparities, mental health? I can tell you now that data, I've not been able to find it. Um, I'll, I'll look again. But, you know, I think, you know, as we pack data onto all these, which, as you know, I totally agree with, um, the lack of information we have is just very troubling. <laughs> so I um, <laughs> thought I'd address that too. I wish we had it. I'll keep looking, but. And, and Tom, um, a quick question about the data issue. Um, are, are you speaking data within California or are you speaking nationally? I think nationally. I mean, my, my, my hunt has been mostly California based, but studies of diversion programs are few and far between. I think because so many of them are prosecutor controlled. Um, so it's a bit of a black box. Um, there are a few studies, but you know, there it's, uh, I mean, for example, in, in Professor Napatov's book, she flagged one page where she, where she talked about it, for example, in the misdemeanor context, right? Uh, just as an indication. So um, it's, uh, and of course, there's a lot of controversy. Well, if you think a case can be diverted, why was it brought in the first place? I, I think you're addressing some of that, Dean Richardson. So, um, I'll continue, but I, unfortunately, I think we're, uh, we're working in a bit of a desert. And that's really the reason I focused on the trial rate. It was the one thing I thought I could sort of <laughs> figure out. Um, and it's imperfect to say the least, but it does seem to be uh, one way to support the idea. And then it, with, with regard to the last question, right? So if, if why are these cases in the first place, um, if they would have been diverted, or I can't remember how you phrase that, but one answer to that as we think about our work is something that Mike mentioned earlier, which is, or someone mentioned earlier, once someone is criminally justice system involved, that gives an opportunity to allow people to get the services that they otherwise couldn't get, right? That they don't otherwise get, even though we all agree that they should before they become criminally justice system involved. And, and this is one way where you could combine the two. So someone is, does get arrested for something, but now we can divert them and give the mental health treatment and all the other sorts of treatment that we were thinking about. Obviously though, that means it, when we're thinking about when do you get, um, what's that word I'm looking for? You, you get one chance under most of these diversion programs, mm -hmm. which is totally unrealistic, right? So if we're thinking about that, people fail, they fall down at least once or twice before it, it, it works. And so that kind of one shot, you must do it right. Otherwise you're going back to prison or, or jail since we're speaking about misdemeanors, although we know people go to prison too, a realistic diversion program that allows for failure and then to have people come back in and I'm sure you know about the LEAD program. We've mentioned it before. Uh, and, and, I, and I know that the one, at least the one in Seattle, I believe, allows people more than one chance, right? It is a real relationship uh, where they follow people and then they fall off the wagon. Let's say it's a drug diversion program and they allow people back in and give them a realistic opportunity um, to, to succeed. It's all about the harm reduction model. I mean, exactly. It, it, it's, uh... It's what we do here in Los Angeles. We operate three lead sites. We, you know, all of our work is is based in harm reduction, including our felony pretrial program. You see, judges do things I would have never imagined. People coming in with dirty tests, They're just re re rearranging their treatment modalities, and and not returning them to custody um, as a way of stabilizing them in the community. And harm reduction is was new to me um, when I took this job, but it's it is the wave of the future. 
Uh, and on the point about sort of building in the reality of recovery, as I know at least New York in their judicial drug diversion program, that's in the statute uh, that explicitly to try to shift, you know, the the culture on the bench to understanding that a little bit more. So there's um, oh, that's great. precedent for that too. Okay. Um, and, you know, and of course, I think in the collaborative courts context, that's one of the best practices uh, when you when you build that in and which maybe we can talk about in a little bit. But, um, you know, it's it's like assembly member Kamlager said, that's sort of litigating culture shifts. Um, it'll be a recurring issue for the committee, but doesn't mean we should shy away from it. So, so Tom, I think as we move on through these issues, this is going to be a particular challenge for you and, and the staff is to sort of coalesce a lot of our thinking and boil it down a little bit so that the next time we talk about this misdiv misdemeanor diversion, we're a little bit more distilled in our thinking, maybe a little bit more data if possible. Not saying that we would agree, but I, I hope that each step, we hear about this three or, you know, you know, a handful of times so that we're all like sort of familiar with it. Um, and I know that the direction might get fuzzier as we go. Um, th so that's gonna be a challenge to you, but I also, you know, the committee members, we all should realize, first of all, you can reach out to Tom anytime and say like, I just had this idea, thought, can you add this to that? Um, but we should also say, wait, wait, that's not what I meant. It was the other thing. So um, anyway, next. Great. So uh, this is what I've termed repeat felony offender diversion, RFOD. Um, this is uh, a program that uh, DA O'Malley spoke about from Alameda County. It's what they call their uh, ACJRP, Alameda County Justice Restoration Program. Um, it's a prosecutor run program. And there's a few core things that I, it's, it's worth keeping in mind. So it's aimed at younger people. Uh, originally, I think the cutoff was 25. They added uh, a few years to it. I think it was 35 by the end. Uh, and it was aimed, and th this is the thing that I think really makes it stand out, is it aimed at people with prior convictions. So as we were just speaking about, you know, so, so many diversion programs, that kicks you out of it, and you're just not even eligible. Uh, and this program is, uh, is for those people. So it's, I think, fairly unique in that regard. Um, and, you know, on the eligibility tip, and this is something that may spawn a, a, a further discussion, uh, your current offense and your old offense had to be realigned. So it's these, what are typically described as lower level felonies, you know, non-serious, non-violent, uh, non-sex offense uh, um, offenses. That, and I think was driven because of the way they funded it was using some of the realignment money that we talked about. So the, that eligibility may not be driven by data in the sense that we're thinking about, but uh, by sort of external considerations. Uh, and then the other key thing about it is it would pair the person in the program with a coach uh, who had been through the system and ideally was sort of from the same neighborhood or, um, you know, cultural background to really help them engage with services and to try to, you know, change whatever led them uh, to being in the system, if, if that made sense. Um, and of course, as we talked about, prosecutors, every, every prosecutor office in the state could set this up tomorrow if they wanted to. There's nothing in the penal code preventing them from doing it. So I talk a little bit about some of the results from what Alameda County has done. So it's being evaluated in comparison to a control group. Um, the initial results look pretty good. I think it's about a 14% reduction or recidivism compared to the control group and I and the idea was that this was aimed at people who had higher recidivism rates um, than I guess the average so any reduction there I think is, is significant um, and as I talked about their eligibility seemed to turn a little bit on some of the constraints on the funding though they were still getting um, a, you know pretty serious felony offenses in there you know auto theft non-residential burglaries including you know uh, things taken from cars, which, you know, in the Bay Area is a hot button topic, identity theft, drug offenses, and there are also some uh, what were charged as robberies, but they're lower, le lower level robberies that could uh, get into the program. So it was, um, you know, aimed at a pretty serious uh, population there. So that's a quick overview, but I think the benefits of including something like this in the penal code are, you know, you encourage prosecutors to do it, you give them the framework to do it and the folks in Alameda County um, that I've spoken to are extremely enthusiastic about it and there'll be pretty good data to back up the um, results from it. 
and the fact that it's aimed at folks who are otherwise typically excluded from these programs, I, I think makes it uh, worth our time. So some of the same things for discussion, you know, what offenses should be eligible? What role does conviction history play? Does aiming at a specific age range make sense? This admission of guilt question, the Alameda program requires admission of guilt, but when I spoke with the folks there about it, um, it wasn't something that I got the impression they were, you know, ready to die on that mountain. It was just the way or on that hill. It was just the way that the uh, program was set up. Um, and then I think we should also think about these, how the AB 109 money may be, you know, sort of causing path dependencies for things that maybe don't necessarily make sense. Yeah, Mike. So uh, why are we considering this as only a prosecutor? You know, the misdemeanor diversion program that was the judge allowed it. Um, why not the same with this? This one requires a lot more infrastructure in that there has to be pairing with coaches um, and it's aimed at the higher level offenses. I think it doesn't necessarily have to be run by prosecutors, but I think as a first entry into sort of more serious offenses, um, but you could Keeping imagine it. going to the probation office. I mean, and if the, the program doesn't exist, then you can't, then the judge doesn't have a, an option to send somebody there. But why not, if it works, it doesn't seem to be naturally or necessarily, I mean, it could be within the DA's office, but it could be within the probation office. It could be within the sheriff's office. Um, and if it's somehow certified, I don't know how we would do that. Um, it seems like a judge, if the judge wanted to, should be able to, to do this, especially if it has good outcomes. Yeah. Um, now, the judges won't in many circumstances. Prosecutors may or may not agree. Um, I'd be sort of curious as kind of a game theory question is if would that reduce the number of times the prosecutors agreed to it if they didn't have all the power? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if other people had thoughts about it, um, but these, you know, these are similar to the collaborative courts, which could be set up anytime, anywhere today. How can we, if we like them, encourage them? I mean, I guess earlier today we talked about financial incentives, right? You could say, your county gets a financial incentive to set up this type of program. But um, if you put it in the penal code that a judge had authority to divert and dismiss or whatever, <coughs> however we're gonna talk about, you know, non, even pre-plea, if they complete a certified program, I don't know, my instinct is why is that all in the prosecutor's and I have something to add to that that you that you just made me think about, uh, uh, Mike, which is in terms of where we place the power or to make these decisions to bring in politics um, for a second. And I'd be curious to hear from the two judges. I, I could also see a world where you place the power within the judges to do to do this, and then the worry, because we know there's it's inevitable that there's going to be some bad result, some right, like you divert someone and they go off and they do some horrific thing, and then there's the movement to remove the judge, right, because it was all your fault. Um, and I'm curious then, are there ways that we can avoid that? It 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 it's, it just strikes me if if you put the power in the judges or you put the power in the prosecutors or in probation, the risk is when something negative happens, whoever it is, that one person who made that judgment is going to be the the one who has to deal with all the fallout. And I, I so I just placed that on the table because I we know that happens, and I don't know what the answer to that is. But I like Michael's idea about thinking about where should this decision-making authority be, or is there a way to diffuse that decision-making authority across a number of institutions? I, just brainstorming now, but I wanted to just raise that particular issue, which I could see could be very challenging. Well, let me just respond to one thing you said. It really doesn't matter um, who makes the decision to divert. If there's a bad outcome, 
And the LA Times writes a story about it. They're not going to mention the DA that approved right. the diversion. They're going to, the judge who signed the order is going to be prominently featured in the article, regardless yeah. of who approved the diversion. Um, I think, I think ju judges are becoming more and more um, comfortable with um, decision making along these lines. But I will say that in the collaborative courts in Los Angeles County, uh, great attention is paid to selecting senior judges with lots of experience and who are more comfortable taking risks um, because there's no question that you've pointed out a very important feature here. There's a lot of risk taking involved in, in diverting some of these more serious crimes. And, you know, we have, we have sort of an agreement within our ODR felony program that nobody gets thrown under the bus when there's a bad outcome. And we've had some. And the first yeah. thing I do is I get on the phone with Jackie Lacey and say, look, I just want you to know so-and-so um, committed to follow. We've had a couple of really bad outcomes, um, but that's in, in, in 5,000 diversions, right? Um, and, and so there's, a, there's a very much a team approach to these bad outcomes where everyone agrees that no one's going to be thrown under the bus. Yeah. Um, but... It's, it's a cultural change, as Carlos has referred to. Yeah. That, that really has to take place from the ground up. Yeah, I, I agree with, uh, with Pete. I mean, again, it's been a long time since I've made these decisions. But I, I uh, really like the model of shared responsibility. Right. For example, in the old drug diversion, 1000.1, you know, the DA would uh, determine eligibility. And then there was, you'd go back and forth on that. But the decision, uh, once eligible, on the suitability aspect was entirely with the judge. So there's flexibility there. So I think, I mean, I like Nancy O'Malley's uh, program. Uh, so, but I think it's something that should be uh, pursued. And then in, in the final analysis, I wouldn't really be that overly concerned about the political consequences of a, of a failed outcome in a particular case, because they are usually very small and you know, judges are always making those kinds of decisions on bail and so forth, and right. a lenient sentence, and you know, the the situation that happened in Santa Clara uh, County really was, uh, uh, I think, uh, kind of a uh, aberrant situation. I mean, that one was really, you know, went went viral, and I don't think that happens that often. You know, they always say that uh, uh, judges are uh, always concerned about the alligator in the bathtub when you're shaving. <laughs> because at least, uh, uh, that's what Otto Kaus used to say that. And you know, that's part of, part of the job. Uh, and you know, that's one of the reasons why, you know, a lot of judges don't like uh, this hybrid system we have of being uh, on the ballot or potentially on the ballot every six years as opposed to a lifetime right. uh, lifetime appointment. So it's just the fact of life. I don't think we're going to change that. I would also add to, I agree with Carlos, that this is a large, this is much more of a concern in smaller counties, rural counties. Yeah, yeah. A county in Los, like Los Angeles where there are 500 judges it's, and, you know, you have to have a quarter of a million dollars to launch a campaign, a meaningful campaign. Um, it's not as big a concern as it is in smaller counties where judges routinely get picked off. Yeah, although Santa Clara County is not a small county. No, there, no, but that was a high profile case. Yeah. It happens, but not that often, thank God. Yeah. I'll lay my cards on the table a little bit. I think judges' jobs are to make, this is the judge's job. Um, I, you know, think punishments and sanctions that's you know traditional judges responsibility and uh i'm really um disappointed actually in the bench that i think is is in general reluctant to take on these types of responsibilities i will also say from a purely data perspective and i'm happy to share this data on polling that we've done about willie horton scenarios it really doesn't have the same um political salience as it, as it used to. Um, we can talk about why, but we all, we all grew up with Willie Horton and with Bill Clinton and saw Mike Dukakis lose the presidency over this, but actually uh, 
you know, my law students don't know who Willie Horton is. Yeah. You know, they <laughs> barely, you know who Dukak- <laughs> yeah. barely know who Mike Dukakis is. Um, so, but we polled on it and it, it just doesn't, it really doesn't have the political salience. Regardless, I really do think this is a judge, judge's uh, um, call for the, for the most part. Um, so I, I would strongly be in favor in general that these types of decisions belong in judges' hands. They can be disputed. They can be appealed. They can be, um, you know, they're going to agree with the DAs a lot, perhaps n- n- the vast majority of times. Yeah. Um, that's fine. But um, they, they, they don't sit there just to rubber stamp what the DA says. My feeling. Um, so I guess I don't know if we have other conversations about this. They mirror some of the things that we were saying earlier about eligibility or not. Um, I would only add in, you know, how could how do you structure a statute that encourages it either financially? Do you give judges authority to do it? Does that just sort of if you build it, it will come? And how do you then? certify. The reason why it works in one county is because um, DA O'Malley has this cohort of peers that she likes in this program that she's willing to send people to. So how do you create a state system? Does it that the state actors have to agree, okay, X program works and they go, or does the Judicial Council? Frankly, the Judicial Council hates taking these on. They hate new responsibilities. It costs them a little bit more money to think these things through. Um, I don't want to uh, overburden them, of course, but th- that would be interesting to see, maybe not necessarily for this, but in general, Tom, how do diversion programs work? How do they choose the pool of, if you do X, then you get the benefit of the diversion. How do they decide what X is? I think in some states it's judges who say X program is certified, maybe DAs, you know, maybe it's just going to AA. I don't know what it is, but this would seem to be a pretty specialized program that would need to be somehow approved by someone. Right. No, that's, uh, that's, Correct. And, you know, one of the things that D. O'Malley mentioned was getting the coaches, the peer support folks um, certified for Medi-Cal uh, reimbursement. So there's there's a venue to doing it there. And um, no, I, I think the idea of shifting the decider for it to the judges makes a, makes a lot of sense. Setting up the infrastructure does seem like something a prosecutor's office could perhaps do if they were invested in it. So it's, you know, it's the chicken and egg problem. Is, is this just going to be a penal code section that, because nobody, because it's up to the judge who's not going to be difficult for them to, you know, get it off the ground uh, versus a prosecutor's office. But um, no, it's something we'll keep, uh, I'll keep thinking about and speaking with you about. Thanks. Uh, any, anybody else on, on, on this topic, or we can move on to, uh, I think, collaborative courts are next. So collaborative courts. So, um, you know, the idea here, uh, you know, collaborative courts, as you know, Mike, as you mentioned earlier, are, have sort of grown up all over the state. I think there's more than 400 at this point, you know, across the entire state, covering a, a range of topics. Um, but there is nothing in the penal code that comprehensively addresses how they operate, who can set them up um, and what, what should sort of happen on, an, on a day-to-day basis. And, you know, by some accounts the sheer number of courts suggests that that works. And, you know, we certainly, I think, heard great enthusiasm for them at the April meeting from the judges who, who do them. Uh, but as I looked around at other states, um, you know, there are states that do have more structure, sort of certification processes for some of the courts um, and just a little more guidance about how evidence-based practices, EBPs, as the catchphrase goes, should operate in this context. Um, And it doesn't seem appropriate, I think, for 
the committee to wade into that area without speaking with the folks in the judiciary. So I think uh, the idea I have here for us is to sort of more formally work with the folks there. And I'll give a, a little bit of a story um, about how something like this happened in Washington. So a few years ago, there was a law passed and on May 15th, and the timeline's important, because <laughs> I know a committee recommending another committee has a bit of a snake eating its own tail quality to it. Uh, but a law was passed in May saying, okay, judges write a report for, you know, how our, what they call therapeutic courts can be unified, how they can be improved. Seven months later, the report came out. It was short, it was seven pages. That includes a cover page, it was really six pages. Uh, and then a year after that, a law based on the report got introduced, it got passed, and then it came in. So we're talking about a, a two-year process. So it doesn't need to be, you know, the bleak house scenario that I think we might be worried about. Um, and, you know, I don't know if this is a good idea for us to do or if we want to sort of table collaborative courts perhaps for year two or year three of our work. Um, but that was sort of uh, what my study has revealed is that California does seem to be a bit of an outlier. There's models in other states, but they're very judge um, uh, influence as seems totally appropriate given the context. How is California an outlier? Just in having sort of no centralized um, or direction and statute for these courts. And can you give a, just a brief outline about what at least let's say that what the Washington statute does to give structure? So the Washington statute, um, it's, it, you know, it gives, it codifies what courts have the inherent authority to do, which is set up these courts. It says you can set them up on any topic you want. You should follow evidence-based practices, which, and I think they specifically referred to the National Drug Court Association, which has a list of principles and is sort of the leading national organization. <clears throat> um, and it also address eligibility criteria. It says, you know, people accused of these offenses shouldn't be admitted but the judge has the discretion to admit people anyway. So it has that, it was described as an Easter egg to me by one of the people who helped draft the bill. Uh, so that's there. And it also addressed very specific Washington court things that I won't get into because they're not applicable with us, but it had to do with, you know, counties working together and superior courts and municipal courts working together, things that won't apply to us. But I think that the statute addressed that um, speaks to the need to really get down into the details with the folks who, you know, deal with this stuff on a daily basis. And I certainly don't think the, our collaboration, if we think it's appropriate, should be limited to the Judicial Council. I think, you know, though, because what makes collaborative courts so unique is that there is that collaboration between, you know, the different professionals involved, not just attorneys, but treatment professionals. Um, so that would seem to me to be the, the prudent way to proceed here. Senator Skinner, I think you might be muted. Sorry. Um, so this would, if we had a <clears throat> statewide statute, and of course, we'd want it to be very flexible if we were going to do this, I think, because then it would uh, eliminate our need to have, um, well, I, I don't know if we have a statute for every collaborative report we've established. I think we've just, we've done it in the budget sometimes. And maybe if it was in a budget, trailer bill, it was policy, I'm not sure. But all the collaborative courts we've set up so far, we haven't had to have individual statutes, have we? We've just had to somehow fund authorize it? What? That, that, that's correct, Senator. So a court just has the inherent ability to do it. Um, right. And you know, you have to get the buy-in from the, your local players. And I, and, and that's why I think that the deeper question is, well, maybe that's fine. Maybe that's the way right. it works. Maybe we don't need to, because the minute we try to put one into statute, it might restrict it more than we would hope. A exactly. So that's why I think, you know, we'd want to be very careful and really, you know, make a considered decision. I, I think the benefits of doing it are a lot of the states that have a centralized authority have data collection um, as part of that. I think right now there's very limited data on the outcome of, of the courts. Some may be much better than others, um, or there may be insights you get in how even a good one can continue to get better. So I think that would be a, a key thing. And just formalizing the sharing of information and, and practices seems to have some benefits. But again, I think we'd really want to, you know, hear from the, the folks who would be affected. And I'm sure their first reaction might be, leave us alone. But, uh, you know, perhaps as we looked at other states and went deeper, I'd see the benefits as well. Okay.
Just, I think it's uh, remarkable how, how much these have flourished and that there is no statutes and this is completely lawless land. And, 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 but maybe for the, for the best, um, I mean, I, I could imagine just a statute on just data collection because oh, there. You know, yeah. that right. would seem to be helpful. Anybody that calls itself a collaborative court needs to report certain things. I don't know. Um, but I definitely would like to hear, Tom, from other states about why they thought a centralized system was beneficial. Um, maybe they had zero and then they grew because of the centralized system. And if we have 400. Right. I have a question about whether diversion courts, do other states have statutes on diversion courts or are they, um, cause that it's not the same as the collaborative courts, but you know, ours pretty much, we have to do a statute almost any time to allow for one. It's a, that's a very interesting question. And that's when you get into the difficulties of really understanding deeply the nuances of, of other states, you know, what, you know, we can't even call collaborative courts the same thing for, from state to state. So, and I think even the line in California between a diversion program and a collaborative court is, is sometimes blurry. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a great question. Um, and, you know, and Mike, uh, one thing that I've seen that the benefits of the centralized states is, you know, if you, if the collaborative court, if the program meets these guidelines, you become eligible for grant funding. So it sort of allows you to level up. So that's, you know, our theme today seems to be financial incentives. So um, you see that elsewhere. And, you know, California does that to a degree. I think the Judicial Council um, has some grant money that they give out for collaborative courts. But, um, you know, at this point to me, it's not entirely clear what the structure is. And perhaps I just haven't spoken to the right person yet. So um, there may be more going on than I can anticipate. But I think the fact that it is, uh, not pellucid is um, a sign that uh, I should go deeper and perhaps there should be more structure here. Okay, well, I'll, um, you know, I think I'll look at the other states, Mike, as you suggested, and, and try to speak to some more players there and sort of see uh, why they did it, what the benefits are, um, and then perhaps reach out to some folks at the Judicial Council and just see if they have any thoughts they'd like to add at this point. And then this is obviously more of a, a long-term project uh, for the committee. Um, so that'll be my next steps. And that brings us to restorative justice. Um, so this is sort of a, I think a similar situation where restorative justice, I think has a potential to do so much um, that we should take the time and the space to really be good uh, advocates for it or voices for it if we, if we feel like it's appropriate. So um, I'll talk a little bit about some of that promise. You know, this was a, um, a program that, you know, Sujatha Baliga, who spoke to the committee uh, in April, helped evaluate in Alameda County. It's a long name, but it seems like a great program. and. What they found uh, was for a program that focused on young people, serious cases with victims, looking at three years of data and about 100 people who completed it in comparison to a control group, they found there was a 44% reduction in recidivism, so that seems significant, and that the vast majority of the victims who participated were satisfied with it and would recommend it to uh, another person. So that, you know, oh, and the last bullet is it was cheap. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's sort of seems to hit our sweet spot, uh, Mike, as you mentioned before in another context. Um, and what I did was the, ask the folks at, um, at Ms. Baliga's organization to sort of send us an idea for how the penal code might address this. And they sent us two statutes. And the main statute sort of created a very powerful way of making restorative justice an alternative to the traditional system where it was, you know, if it was a case with a young person that had a victim that was a felony or an aggravated misdemeanor, it would go to a restorative justice program. And that program had to have a track record, had to have been around for three years and be evaluated and have uh, 
similar results to what we just saw. So there had to be the infrastructure in place that, um, you know, have, have these good outcomes. So that would be very powerful. Um, but at this point, I feel like we need to understand it better, think about some of the issues there, you know, what role does the defense council play? How does confidentiality get involved? How does the court get involved? How do we um, address some of those those things that might come out of it? There's also an issue of access to information from police reports and things like that. So there's a lot of those details that would you'd want to work out. But I think they sort of tee up the issue of being like this. This would be a very powerful, serious change to the penal code. Um, and I think if you all are interested in it, it's something that there's a lot. To, there's also a lot to study out there. Uh, if you all are interested in, in continuing to think about it, I'll, I'll keep doing it. But I thought this was an appropriate moment to sort of pause and just sort of take everyone's temperature. Because um, I think, I don't mean to speak for everyone, but I think for all of us, it's, it's not an area where we have a lot of direct experience. So it's perhaps um, a bit outside of our comfort zones. Yes. <laughs> 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 Definitely more study. <laughs> Very intrigued by this. I guess these are what they call leading questions when I when I put them on a slide. <laughs> but that's good. It seems that we have a bit of a theme uh, to me going on, and this goes back to the other thing: is we're all looking for at least, especially this, alternatives to incarceration. But what is the alternative, and how do we just define? and certify the alternative as being beneficial. So is the alternative the peer program from Alameda County? Is the alternative a restorative, drug prog uh, uh, restorative justice program? Is the alternative a drug program? And how do we develop these, the, the infrastructure of the various different alternatives that could be used? Um, so I almost think that the same, whether it's a certification process that, that, that that's maybe the missing piece and that could be used for other things, right? You could certify a diversion program the same way you could certify a drug treatment program, the same way you could do a peer support program and that a, a counties could have a menu of these things that once certified, a judge could divert to. That sounds like a great way of thinking about it. Because um, right before you spoke, I was, if, if we had multiple programs, like let a thousand flowers bloom, right? Like if we had multiple programs and counties were able to choose on your model, Michael, which one they thought would work best. And we, it would be a natural lab, a natural experiment to, to, to see how these different programs fare. Because otherwise, I think it's hard to choose one to support versus another with the lack of information we have. I mean, so we have such a lack of imagination. Our imagination is prison bars. Yep. And then maybe like ankle monitors. <laughs> <laughs> and you can cut off still somehow. <laughs> right. And, and, and AA. You know, it's like right. it doesn't get much more sophisticated than that. And we're so, you know, we could talk about discretion and eligibility and presumptions and blah, blah. I mean, we're lawyers, so we go that way. But um, if there's a way that we can in, imagine these alternative, I don't even know what we call them, mm -hmm. baskets, maybe that's something that we should I explore. I really love that idea. I really love that. Just a menu, right? It's sort of what you're, you're saying. And then we just are able to have different counties choose from that. And who knows what would grow out of that too, based on experience. There might be even things we're not even thinking or imagining right now. So. Right. It could be, oh, we did, there's a farming program that is an alternative program that right. is, it gets certified the same way that all these other ones. And look at the results we get. Mm -hmm. Great lettuce. <laughs> so I, I think that was a little bit of the vision for the uh, community correction, the CCPs, I can't remember the, the acronym. What I'm hearing is the difference is um, 
giving that menu to the to the judge to be a little bit more of the decider instead of it lying in the probation department or you know um, sort of in some of those players outside of the courtroom. Um, you know, I'd have to look into that a little bit more, but I think there's sort of a a model for that, and you know, successful, unsuccessful in different ways. I'm sure, and obviously, some of the number com loggers um, audit of some of the programs might give us some insight into that. But that that's sort of my understanding of the way that the CCPs work is um, to sort of encourage creativity in in counties. So that's uh, another venue to explore it. And something, you know, I have a ever growing list to follow up with uh, uh, Director Bosler the Department of Finance about. So this will probably be, uh, be on there. She emailed me. She was very, uh, she was, she had a great time yesterday, she said so. Excellent. Well, what well, you, we, we just need to have her and Mia and Riken come to, and Steve Raphael, you know, we seem to have everyone who's ever come needs to come back to every meeting. We'll just have, you know, a huge <laughs> Zoom. Well, they all wanted to have forward. coffee with assembly member Comlogger, so maybe that's just the <laughs> coffee clash. And Senator Skinner, too. I remember the sheriff mentioned. Yes, she was invited. I noticed that. she would. They were invited, but none of the rest of us. We definitely were not. Yeah, yes. that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I, um, I'll, I'll, I'll keep looking at re restorative justice. And, you know, as Mike said, very happy to, to speak with any of you individually about this to, to, to get your temperature and see how, how you think about this, because um, that would be helpful to me and hopefully to, to, to you as well, particularly on this issue. I feel like it just... Uh, you know, I've got too much of a lawyer brain, I think, and that's working against us. So I need to break out of that a little bit. <laughs> I, well, I think all of this is so fantastic. So thank you for pulling all this together like this. Of course. Thank you, Dean Richardson. Okay, probation. Um, so we're going to talk about length of terms here. The proposal is to limit probation terms to two years, and we can talk about that number. Uh, but first, just a little background to give us a little bit of the, of the state of play. Uh, in January, if anyone remembers when that was, uh, the governor made a number of, of proposals in the budget. Uh, and I'm not mentioning here, I should say, changes to the SB 678 funding formula. I know Senator Skinner mentioned those earlier. I just didn't feel like it was appropriate, but um, that was part of it as well. So the first was your two-year limit on probation terms for felonies and misdemeanors, uh, increasing the intensity of supervision for certain misdemeanors. I, I believe it was essentially the Prop 47 list, as you spoke about earlier, Judge Espinoza, um, to put those folks on, on supervision, essentially, um, and then to provide a clear path to get off probation early. So those were what I, what I saw as the three key proposals, uh, the May budget, they were all gone. Um, and then, so we can talk a little bit about what that two year limit, where that would put us in comparison to other states. So this is a, a study that I'll put uh, two caveats on. The first is it's from 2016, and there has been a lot of work across the country in places reforming their probation systems. Um, so this not, may not be entirely up to date. And it only considered, I think, about 20 states, um, but I think they were picked to be representative of, of the place. So you can sort of see this list and you can see where California currently falls, um, you know, pretty far down the list. And the other wrinkle here is, you know, th this is the maximum length allowed by statute. I think in practice, most probation terms are not going to, you know, be more than three or, or five years in a, in a felony case. And, you know, Judge Espinosa, please correct me if that's uh, different than your understanding. Um, but just, you know, as far as what's permissible, California ranks um, down there. And you'll notice that the two other states, you know, Washington and Florida are in that, you know, one year, two year range. So what's happening now is, uh, as, as she mentioned, some member Tom Lager has a bill pending. Uh, oh, she's it's back. Oh, great. Perfect um, <laughs> It's right on cue. I'm here listening. I'm doing double duty. Of course. I think we all are. <laughs> Uh, Pass the assembly uh, pending in the Senate, I believe, and that would uh, shorten felony terms to two years and misdemeanor sentences to one year. Um, so, you know, I, I think uh, the reason to doing this is research basically shows if probation is going to make a difference, it's going to happen earlier on. Uh, increasing the length of the term may have even criminogenic effects. As we saw yesterday, the more intensely you're supervised, the more you're arrested. Um, obviously that may not, you know, consider footnotes to that statement and read, you know, caveat it however you need to. 
But uh, there is a suggestion that uh, it just doesn't make sense to go beyond that length of time for most people. Um, so that is the idea. If uh, assembly member Kamalagar, if your bill doesn't make it through this time around, I think it it's, would be a great thing for the committee to, to consider and we can, I can expand the research to other states and the uh, support for the lower limits, but um, you know, a lot of this work is, is done. So anybody has any thoughts, would love to uh, hear them. So I have a question. Um, I know that there was a bill last year or the year before that proposed changes to the, the espungement process mm. um, that, that made it automatic at the, at the success, upon the successful completion of probation. And I'd like to, I don't know what happened to that bill. I don't know if it passed, but I would like to see us um, have some conversation about removing that responsibility from the probationers to go to court, file a petition, have a hearing. To me, in my mind, if, if somebody successfully completes probation, the expungement should be automatic. The Department of Justice should receive a notice. You know, this record has been expunged because this person has successfully completed probation and eliminate the, the, the burden of going to court. Um, it's, it's definitely one of the many barriers to successful reentry, this whole process of getting your record expunged. Um, here, here. So I don't know, I don't know where that fits in this conversation. Maybe it doesn't fit here at all, but I just wanted to mention it while, you know, things pop into my mind and pop right out. Um, so I just wanted to mention that while I, while it was on my mind. Um, then I have a procedural question. Is there gonna be any break for nourishment at the noon hour or are we just gonna plow through? Because my, my hope is to plow through. This is the last of Tom's slides, if I'm correct. Tom, is that right? Well, no, there, there's another probation topic, but it's equally, uh, I think it won't take up too much time. All right. okay. I hope that we can plow through and then the administration stuff is like five minutes. Okay. Cool. So I'd like to plow through if we can. All right. Um, before we plow through, just on uh, Judge Espinosa's comment, I wanted to um, second I, that this, uh, just the expungement process is way too complicated. Okay. Okay. So. Um, and opaque. Yeah, so the more we can go in that direction, the better, because, you know, even if we fix the penal code, anybody with that tail of a conviction, there's everything in our world is designed to basically prohibit you from moving ahead. And so the more we can, uh, you know, cut that tail entirely, the better. Here, here, agreed 100%. <laughs> Yeah. That, that should have been part of our alternatives to incarceration. Add it. Yeah. And I think there's consensus on that across the uh, spectrum that, you know, certainly if there's a process in place, it should not, you know, the old expression is the process is the punishment. The, you're, shouldn't that expunging shouldn't be further punishment. And I believe Mr. Valley mentioned that yesterday too, about when she went to an expungement clinic, how difficult it was. So I, uh, of course, I'll add that to the agenda. It's already on the agenda, just not at the top. And also, um, oh, thank you. Also, the fact that um, uh, folks feel like they're not really ever expunged. They have challenges trying because of the background check. So you might go through this arduous experience with an expungement clinic, but if you're still doing a background check for a job, it still pops up. And so that's a challenge for a number of folks. Yeah, very, very, very complicated. Anyway, I just want to say that I'm in favor of the 12 month uh, misdemeanor uh, probation. I mean, I did that for many, many years, it's more than sufficient. If the defendant needs additional time to complete one of the conditions like payment, you can always extend it. Uh, two years for felony is fine. The only uh, thing I'd want to mention is again, with respect to the vehicle code, I think it's in the vehicle code that probation is for three years. And one of the programs, uh, I forget, you know, it's the 30 month program uh, for a second DUI uh, contemplates uh, at least a three year probation and that's a misdemeanor. So we, I think we're gonna see this tension between vehicle code and, and penal code in a lot of these misdemeanor uh, recommendations. 
So I do want to say and health and safety for and this one, safety. right? And there are exemptions that are in it because there are some programs that are that are longer than the term right. being um, suggested in probation, which we've actually talked about in committee. I think maybe in the prior committee hearing that we had. Um, and of course, it still gives discretion to, you know, judges based on, you know, um, gross incompliance of the probationer, but it does address the issue of the technical violations. And there are just, there is data as well as anecdotal stories about how folks are um, technically violated for things that really can contribute to longer terms that are not really sort of indicative of how you would support lowering recidivism rates. Um, and also reflective of the culture that's going on in certain probation departments, just like there's data out there that shows that some probation departments are actually very innovative and have focused on offering shorter sentences and have seen recidivism rates go down because they're front loading with supportive services, which are things that we've also been talking about um, in our committee. So the hope is actually we don't see this next year it gets through. But um, it's certainly part of a larger discussion that we've been having. And I should mention that this was um, a, a proposal that even the governor had proposed in the January budget before COVID. And that CPOC supported, um, as I think that's the chief probation officer. That's Correct. important too. In the budget, it assumes that there's funding that goes with it. <laughs> right. Um, since all the pushback with SB 678 and how you incentivize. Um, so, nuance. Of course. Do you have any sense on this, the likelihood that this is going to pass? Well, it got through the assembly, um, I think with like 45, 46, which is good. Um, and I've been praying to the public safety gods in the Senate and so thankful that uh, I sit on you're, this. You're here with the priestess. Yeah. Uh, so we, you know, we've been having positive discussions with probation, but people are concerned about money. I mean, all the conversations that we're having, it's about money. And if you dig deeper, you start to talk to folks. I mean, I was on a call with CPOC. They had a number of their chiefs on. Um, they're doing things very differently. They know the good counties, they know the bad counties. They know the counties that are really doubling down with um, contracting with a, um, a social community-based organizations to offer services. They know the ones that aren't doing it. You know, I even talked to folks in our county who talked about the power transition with regards to leadership and then seeing a difference in um, the amount of programming that was being offered, how in-depth it was, how often assessments were being done. And so that is, it's not something that we talk about, but I thought it was, um, um, you know, interesting that the, the sheriff yesterday said, let me, let's have a cup of coffee and I can talk to you about this stuff. I mean, you know, they, so we, they know what's up. Um, so I think it will get through, but the push will be, um, the funding, the state likes it because it suggests a savings, but the counties don't because the business model, quite frankly, for probation departments is a little skewed in terms of how they get their revenue. So just a little um, uh, heads up, Ms. Kamlecker Dev, you've got 48 votes on the floor for your bill. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> why I had to get off the hearing earlier is because I'm setting all the bills for uh, my hearing, and so uh, I factored those kind of things in setting it, and yes, uh, her bill is going to be heard by the Senate, but of course then it still has to go to our probes committee and our floor and then back to her house, but I don't think we're amending it. I'm going to talk to my staff. I'm trying to minimize uh, amendments on anybody's bills just because whatever, but anyway, you did get 48 votes, so that's a good sign. I always like to undervalue. So thank you. <laughs> I get nervous in my own house. Great. Well, we'll, uh, we'll stay tuned then, I guess. Okay, this is the last topic, and this is about uh, who can get on probation and, and who can't, who's eligible for it. Um, so the idea here, well, there are two ideas. The first is to follow up on what you were saying earlier, Mike, about 
the value that presumptions can have uh, to create presumptions in favor of probation, which do not currently exist in the penal code. And there are also a number of offenses where there are essentially mandatory incarceration sentences where you cannot get probation. Um, it's not, a, not an option. So here's where we are right now. There's one offense or class of offense uh, from Prop 36 where probation is required, nonviolent drug possession. Most offenses, uh, it's available. There's this smaller class where it's presumptively unavailable unless uh, you know, the judge makes special findings. And then there's the case of the offenses where it's just not an option at all. And so the proposal here would be to add a fifth category, I suppose, uh, where it's the probation is the presumptive sentence. Um, and of course, the discussion here could also be increasing that first category of mandatory probation. So that might be something we want to continue to think about. Uh, so presumptive probation is something that I hesitate to say it's sweeping the nation, but uh, a lot of states have been doing it lately. I think the number I put in the memo was eight or nine in the last 10 years. Um, and so there's some data from North Dakota that I think is interesting for the committee to consider. This is two years of data from 2013 to 2015. So there was wide coverage. Almost 70% of convictions in the state um, were covered by the presumptive probation statute. Uh, and the use of probation went up uh, during the time uh, that this was happening. And there was a significant reduction in the people sent to prison. Um, and all the while, felony convictions were increasing, though it seems to be they classify something as a felony that most states don't that was driving these numbers. And of course, North Dakota, you know, I, I don't have the numbers, but I assume the corrections population there would fit into one or two of our prisons. So there may be some things that make it an inapt comparison, but at least as far as the increased use of probation, that number I think is the one that's most interesting because I think one of the concerns we would have with something like this is once things go into that black box of plea bargaining, are we just gonna reach an equilibrium and things are gonna be what they were before? So that was, I thought, very encouraging. Um, and on the second idea about um, making more offenses have probation as an option where it currently isn't, um, the list is, it covers things you'd expect, but it's pretty heterogeneous. It's hard to sort of classify them as one thing, but there are a number of drug related offenses um, that might be a good place to start. And in fact, uh, the movement to do that has started. I think a bill was introduced last week, SB 378, that would uh, begin to uh, make some of those changes. So I think the questions for us or are how people feel about these presumptions, what offenses might be appropriate, what it would take to overcome the presumption, and then uh, that final question of allowing probation just as an option in more circumstances. If you want comments, uh, yeah, create yeah. a presumption for uh, probation. Absolutely. Um, how can it be overcome? I don't know. Depends on the particular case. I don't have an opinion right. about that right now. Um, allow probation as an option for some offenses? Yes. That's my input, Tom. <laughs> Great. No, that's, that's, I'll, I'll keep plugging away unless anybody wants to go any deeper as any, any well, other thoughts. Yes, Senator Skinner, please. Um, I'd like to, I would like to get some more input from uh, formerly incarcerated around that. Uh, I think in general, my assumption is, yes, create presumption for probation, that's better. However, there are sometimes so many limits on the person um, under the probation terms that it's really a negative. So, um, you know, you just take the Bay Area. I mean, LA County is so large you can probably find uh, a job within LA County. So if there is a limit on you and probation to not leaving your county, it may not have as big of an impact. But like in the Bay Area, if you can't limit your county, if you cannot leave your county, or say even the Central Valley, if you cannot leave your county, you can't get a job. So there's <clears throat> a lot of, um, of limitations that are put when you're on probation that can almost be harder to overcome than a short jail sentence. And so I guess I would like to talk some more to people who are impacted in the system to understand better what 
you know, because we want it to work for people. I so could. I have to I, say, I think that that's well, a, there's, but that's a, same thing happens in LA County. I mean, we've got. I mean, I I shared some on the floor when I was presenting the bill. There are all kinds of things. I mean, making people have make a decision between going to community college and get going to their probation visits and having probation say, I'm not going to be flexible in terms of, you know, giving you a different time or, you know, saying if you even go to look at an apartment, if you sign a lease, I have to be involved to approve. And the crime, you know, um, that they were charging has nothing to do with where they're living. So it, it, uh, I have to say, you know what? I, I take back exactly what, thank you, Senator Skinner and Kam Lager, Dove, you're totally right about that. The, the, and then it just reminds me of the second, whatever number you want to put it, where the, the, the two researchers were showing us those graphs of jail time only versus probation and, or supervision plus jail time and the impact that it had on what was it, new criminal activity, whatever that was, I can picture the graph. You're completely right. Take everything back that I just said about the presumption, unless we are thinking more about the study that we heard about yesterday and what the conditions of probation are. I, so I think it's probably a better conversation to kind of talk about conditions of probation mm -hmm. and how they're decided. Exactly. Because I understand if someone says, you know, you shouldn't, con you, you know, part of your probation is not to affiliate with, you know, gang members. Right. That becomes problematic when your cousin mm -hmm. might have been affiliated with a gang five years ago and is living with your mother because exactly. they're looking for work and you're going to visit your mother. You are not going to have an interaction with your cousin, but yep. your cousin is sleeping on the couch of your mother. Yep. And so it's, it's very easy to say, don't affiliate with a gang member, but that is a very real scenario right. that we're not taking into consideration. And so how we look at what conditions what conditions are and the intention behind the condition because right. not affiliating with a gang member makes sense you know in a very objective analytical space right but not visiting your mother because you can't control when your cousin is going to be there and your cousin is not actively affiliated m makes that condition very complicated totally so right. i think it would be better to have a more robust dissection of the intention behind conditions. Totally right. And, and who is a gang member and what and who gets to decide that and all of those that you're completely right. I agree with all that. Um, so I have a question. Are probation conditions statutory or not? I think they are to a degree, you know, there's a list of standard conditions and there can be specialized ones. You know, I was, I was just pulling up an article that I read about this and I think the, uh, just the title sort of speaks to what it says where it's just called be good and obey all laws. I mean, that is sort of, I think the, a lot of the probation. <laughs> uh, and in fact, it, it cites, I think this changed, but recently that in California, you could be revoked if you had become abandoned to a vicious life. So whatever the heck that, means, you know, uh, I'm sure it was interpreted different ways, but I think there is a lot of work to do in that area. And I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, there's diversity county by county. And, um, I have us, you know, CPOC has been a great uh, uh, partner. And well, I don't know if I want to say, they probably wouldn't want me to say partner, but a good source of information. I'm, and I've asked them for info on some of these things. So um, we'll continue to do that. I also want to highlight Senate, something Senator Skinner said, and it applies to all of these alternative programs, which I've heard multiple times, is that you get a chance, you get offered for collaborative courts, alternative programs, a year of drug treatment or a week in jail. And a year of drug treatment might be the best thing for you, but a lot of people say, the time. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to do a week in jail. 
Well, the and other one is, why are we always linking the time to the program? I mean, like, do you- it does, a week long, because a week long drug program is worthless. Right, right, right. But I'm saying like, if you have a program that's, you know, a, a two years, for example, that, you know, you're going to anger management or what have you, and then the probation is a year. I mean, I understand, I do understand why we link the two, but time on probation, I don't think, should be based on these other sort of artificial timelines with regards to programming. I mean, you can take a program. We, I know we're well, saying we agree completely, but in a plea bargain context, they're going to say I you know. do a week in jail or you do this program or you do a month in jail versus a two-year program. I think a lot of people are like, let me right. do the jail time, not worry about your stupid program. Correct. That some people argue doesn't work and then you're dealing with the cost and all that. Yeah. Um, so I, I'd be curious if there are studies or any ways to get around that problem. Um, I've heard that particularly what's uh, in these mental health courts, that they don't work except for serious crimes, right? Because they don't, if you are, if you have only a minor crime, you have so much better incentive to take the short, the relatively short sentence. But if your sentence exposure is big, multiple years, mm -hmm. but the program is the same length or shorter, then you're incentivized to go into the program. So, and sometimes there are waiting lists to get into the program, so you have to wait in jail anyway. So, I, th I think what you were saying, Senator Skinner, we want to av avoid the adverse, the, the, um, what, the, the opposite of what we're trying to do. <laughs> I'm losing my train of thought here. I have a, I have a question for uh, yeah. Tom. Uh, do we have a list of the crimes in the penal code that are ineligible for probation? Yes, if you look at Exhibit C to the last C. of the 15,000 memos I sent you, uh, you you'll, you'll find it there. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's, um, it's, it's, it's uh, pretty, page four and five. Lengthy. Yeah, because I, I recall that there's a sentencing judge that all the judges have this huge sort of cheat sheet that's mm -hmm. put out by some group. It's about, uh, I don't know, 30 inches by 30 inches. And a large portion of that deals with probation ineligible crimes or mandatory conditions of probation. And so it's, it's a very complicated area because it's, it's, those terms are kind of embedded in some of the statute and it takes a, a number of of years really to sort of have them at the top of your head. I don't have them anymore, but uh, it's, I think it would be helpful just to look at those before we make a decision on, you know, these decisions on whether probation should be uh, presumptive or, or whatever uh, we do. I mean, it's, it's quite a list, Carlos. Yeah, yeah, uh, just before, right I, through it. I can, I can throw, I mean, it may not be helpful, but I could throw it up now. Um, okay. We got and of it. Course, the other part of it is the role that the DAs play in all of this. Yeah. Um, and how many of them, well, you know, I, it I would be curious to see some data on the percentage of, you know, DAs that are kind of uh, supportive and, and what kinds of conditions they want as part of con uh, probation and if judges sort of are offering uh, something um, that might not have been supported or offered initially by given up by the DAs and so right. and then there becomes that kind of negotiation where in fact people right. can be even harsher conditions so there's these very complicated nuances to the judge's point about how probation in reality plays out because there right. is a dance that happens in the courtroom. Right. And the one that I recall now, you know, many years later is, you know, possession of narcotics for purposes of sale. Uh, you know, it's punishable. Low term is like three years, but the typical first offender gets a year in county jail, three years probation. But if you commit a second offense, priorable, probation ineligible, so the person's looking at three years automatic, the DA wouldn't budge on that, even if you feel like giving the guy uh, a second chance, do another year or whatever, uh, your hand, the judge's hands are really tied. Uh, so, and that, that's kind of a, 
a very common offense, at least in the LA Superior Courts back in the day. Uh, so probation's not, you're not eligible for probation with that kind of a prior. But I'm sure it applies in other situations as well. So just be nice to know, I, I don't have exhibit C, I look, but uh, <laughs> I didn't copy it. Uh, you know, and on that same point, uh, Justice Mourinho, I, I've asked, um, I'm trying to get more information about the, you know, what are the most common offenses on probation and to just sort of see what yeah. the landscape is too. Right. And, and to your second point about sort of the, um, the uh, judge's ability to have more flexibility in fashioning a plea bargain, I mean, that's something that's on my research agenda too, to look at the plea bargaining rules and, you know, how open pleas work in California versus other states. Because I know, um, you know, my impression is that the way they work here, it's, it's you know, you open plea to the entire indictment, all the enhancements, and you have to work with what's there. But I think uh, in other states, there's more flexibility. You know, it gets very complex based on the seriousness of charges, but, you know, not letting that those initial charges really, you know, dictate the whole outcome a lot of the times. So that, that's another sort of way to think about this, I think, that gets very fact specific, as you said. Right. Remember last session, we actually talked about civil compromise, or maybe it was two. Yeah, 1388 or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. Uh -huh. So hopefully Not, that case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rarely used in a real criminal case. It's, you know, it's more of a personal injury type of situation. Okay. Tom, are we done with old business? Yes, sir. Do you feel like you have enough direction to move forward on these pieces? I think so. And I, you know, um, I, I feel comfortable following up with folks too, if I, you know. Yeah, I, again, I want to encourage that. So you, the rest of the committee members should know that Tom and I are in very regular contact almost daily, if not actually multiple times a day. But um, I hope that you all use him as a resource as well, especially among the related to questions that you might have raised amongst these particular issues to make sure that they're clarified to him so we don't have to do it all, all the time, all together. It's perfectly kosher to talk with him um, without us all. I, obviously, it's good to have the whole conversation, but just, um, all right. I'm going to move on to administrative business unless there are any other substantive issues that we want to discuss. Going once. All right, I'm gonna move through this quite quickly to try to get on. Data, it's come up every single time. Before all of you guys were even nominated as possible, uh, there is a very, very strong piece of, the, our enable, of our enabling statute that says all state agencies must give us data upon request. Despite that statutory language, no, no agency has given us data. We have been working on this for close to a year now with the governor's office, with CDCR, with the attorney general's office. It's extraordinary. We are making slow progress. We are asking for a lot. I'm not pretending that we're not asking for a lot, but I really think that if, if we can get the data, not only will it inform these specific questions that we're dealing with, but that we can really develop world-class, certainly the best database and of criminal justice data in the country and really be able to interrogate all of these questions. All the numbers are out there, they exist. If we know how to throw a curveball to, you know, one batter versus another batter, we should know how to, what the best punishment should. I mean, I really believe that, uh, excuse the sports metaphor. I'm, I want to get it. I'm working very hard. On top of that, I think I told you all that CZI, which is the Chan Zuckerberg initiative, is going to pay for it all. They're very excited about it. Yeah, I mean, if anybody has political concerns about working with them, I just want to know that they have pledged and promised they are never going to touch the data. They are not we're not giving them, we're not giving Facebook a whole bunch of private data. They are, they're just paying for it. A third party vendor who works with state agencies all the time, yes, exactly, um, is, will be the, the entity that will um, develop the data, do the data analysis, run queries for us, make it all pretty and do it all. So um, I think it might, it would be worth it to have um, 
that given that you use the baseball analogy, we should find some statisticians who do not usually do criminal justice work to look at the data. Because the reason that you, you had that revolution in baseball is because non-baseball people started looking at that data and they were not already looking through a certain lens. So, uh, you know, anyway. Believe out. me, a friend of mine is a, a, a sabermetrics person for ESPN. I was literally thinking about calling him and saying, okay, how do you, how do you start looking at this kind of stuff? Um, but you're absolutely right. Uh, I have colleagues at Stanford, obviously, and Song, I'm sure other folks. And I mean, but getting the data is the first thing. I thought that the folks who presented yesterday were really so pretty savvy about that. They're a little couple steps ahead of us. But if we can get this data, I mean, it's truly, it rev, would be truly something special for the state of California. We'd be way ahead of every other uh, state. So I'm pushing hard on that. Next, hiring. Right now, as you might know, Tom is really the only substantive uh, lawyer that we have on staff. Barbara and Brian are very helpful on administrative issues, but Tom is really our only subject matter expert. He's been doing an extraordinary amount of work and a lot, and I think doing a very good job all by himself. We have a state budget to hire one more attorney. We are working on that. That's slow going, but we're doing that. In addition, we have, um, there is an attorney that, um, works for the Public Defender Office in Los Angeles, uh, actually, that the, 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 uh, the Public Defender's Office has offered to uh, Sagund, is that the right word to us? That's, um, yes, that's the word. I don't know if it's the right word, but yes. Oh, what's the word? Secundment? <laughs> to lend us to, for research help. Okay. Um, and then we've also been reached out for, for foundations that are also very interested in our work and may uh, fund a fellow research person, data analyst, data analyst, pursuing all that. Hope to have good news on that in the near future. But we definitely need more staff work and that is ramping up. A scheduling uh, matter is that um, in part because of Zoom and in part because we realize how big this process is, we're thinking about having another sort of Remember, we had sort of a seminar meeting, not a full substantive meeting. Um, probably next month, we'll be in touch with you and your offices about scheduling that. Not a full day thing, not nearly as long as this, but to hear from other stakeholders if, if that's all possible. Um, I have been in close contact with the governor's office um, about all of our work. They are very enthusiastic. They have also agreed that we should be looking ahead of the curve in terms of all the emergency um, and COVID issues that are going on. And that hopefully that we can present in January a very thoughtful package of reforms that they can get fully behind uh, while they are dealing right now with putting out fires. So um, I keep them pretty abreast. We're obviously an independent agency. We can do what we want. But uh, uh, I think it's good practice uh, to keep in close contact with them. And I think that they've been good partners so far. They're also helping with the data piece. So um, I, hope, I hope as a result of COVID, we're also sort of tracking how things are progressing with the courts to maybe use this as um, um, food for thought uh, or to provide some examples of how there we can maybe change some policy you know people are now the courts are now using webex and tele doing telephonic meetings i've heard there have been greater efficiencies um and so maybe we can use that you know as we're thinking about things to consider uh next year legislatively yeah i think some of the things that they're considering they as as emergency measures that they want to um see if they can become more regular used, um, but I'm happy to chat off. I consider that kind of my day. Some of the, I keep them abreast of committee business. Um, they're very, you know, enthused about what we're doing. I know in our day jobs, we have other business with them. Um, and I'm happy to, you know, chat with you all about that, but I'm tr trying my best to keep lines be between my various hats. 
Um, and then finally, I think as a matter of business, we need to approve the minutes from our last meeting. They should be in the materials. Um, does anybody have any concerns or edits or things that they want to add to the minutes? Okay, uh, I'm gonna, I guess I'll call for a vote on adopting the minutes. So moved. Okay, any, uh, any objections? No. Okay, the minutes are approved. Tom, I see you logged on. Is there anything that we need? One, one last quick scheduling thing. So our next meeting is in September. Uh, that second day, Friday, we're due to start at nine. I was wondering if we could start at 10.30. Uh, Dean Richardson, your assistant said you might have a conflict that morning. Mm -hmm. It would be to make sure we had her full um, presence that day. So I just wanted to ask the committee about that. Yeah, that's fine. Let's do scheduling stuff uh, off you know, line and because otherwise we'll get, but yes, that sounds good. Thank you. Barbara, did I miss anything? No, that seems to cover it. All right. Thank you all. Uh, we are now adjourned. Have a good weekend. It was a long couple days. It was inspiring to me. I think we made progress. And uh, thank you all uh, very much. It's good to see you. Stay healthy, stay safe, all that. And um, until next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank you.